Now, this one involves Russia, Ukraine. So I don't know if you got to see this segment the other night, but uh, Chris Hedges was on Jimmy Dore and they were talking about what should Ukraine do right now at this moment? Like what really makes the most sense, basically? So but before I get into that, I do want to tell you what Henry Kissinger is saying. So Henry Kissinger, of all people, Mr. War Criminal himself, even he is saying we should have peace. Now, for those who are not familiar, Henry Kissinger, FYI, there is a book written by Christopher Hitchens called The Trial of Henry Kissinger, and that book examines his war crimes. That guy is calling for peace. Let's take a look at that. Kissinger says Ukraine should cede territory to Russia to end war. Again, that's coming from Mr. War Criminal himself. I almost fell out of my seat when I heard that. <laughs> Let's go down. I'll just read a short part of this and then I'll get to the video. Former U.S. Secretary of State Henry A. Kissinger said Monday that Ukraine should cede territory to Russia to help end the invasion, suggesting a position that a vast majority of Ukrainians are against as the war enters its fourth month. Speaking at a conference at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, Kissinger urged the United States and the West not to seek an embarrassing defeat for Russia and Ukraine, warning it could worsen Europe's long-term stability. Again, this is coming from Mr. War Criminal himself, Joe Biden. You know you done fucked up, right? You know you're really messed up when you have someone like him putting you to shame. <laughs> Gamer said, <laughs> Kissinger needs prison. Yeah, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So that's that. Now, let's go into this discussion with Chris Hedges and Jimmy Dore because Chris Hedges actually goes a little bit uh, deeper with this. Of course, he's very knowledgeable about this. So I want to go ahead and get this started here. And I'll add this to the screen and I will chime in in between. And I did not mean to rhyme there, but it happened. So here we go. Speaking at the World Economic Forum, Henry Kissinger said the Ukraine should cede territory to Russia to help end the invasion. Kissinger made this claim not because he's a Russian asset, but because he understands that Europe's economy is beginning to implode. So let me bring in uh, Chris Hedges on this. Now, Chris Hedges knows a thing or two about things. And um, what do you make of Kissinger coming out and saying this? Why would he be unleashed to tell the truth? because he comes out of uh, a long history of detente and Cold War relations. Uh, he, uh, George Kennan, the, the great Sovietologist, uh, they all understood that we shouldn't expand NATO beyond the borders of a unified Germany. At the time, Kennan lived long enough to uh, decry the expansion of NATO as the greatest uh, mistake of the Cold War era. I just want to chime in here for just a second and um, elaborate about the expansion of NATO. So for those who are not know, I know some of you are newer to my channel, but I actually started school in Germany. So I was actually there when the Berlin Wall fell. So I remember this very well. And after the Berlin Wall fell, NATO was the agreement was that NATO was not supposed to expand. Obviously, it expanded anyway, and that's why we're in the situation now. So I just wanted to chime in there and, and mention that part because that's really what is the cause of a lot of this. Had they had stuck to the agreement, the original agreement, after the Berlin Wall fell, we would not be in the situation. So let's go back in. Uh, the, the balance of power, power politics, uh, which, by the way, is what it was disrupted in the Middle East. Iran and Iraq used to balance each other out. And then, of course, we went in there and essentially gave the Iraqi governments to the Shia and made it a province of Iran. Uh, and, uh, and, and so Kissinger's going back to that old playbook of making sure that there are, uh, uh, th there never is an alliance formed between China and Russia. Uh, and, and, and during the old Soviet Union, 
uh, especially when Mao visited, uh, he felt that Stalin didn't treat him with appropriate uh, respect and deference. Uh, so that's that's always been part of the kind of geopolitical game, and and that's where he's coming. I hate to agree with anything Kissinger uh, says. Uh, he, he of course. Uh, alone should spend the rest of his life in prison for what he did in 1973 against Salvador Allende and the Chilean people. Um, uh, but he's right. Uh, he's right. They, 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 that's how it's going to end. Uh, but this is, and I think even the very cynical policymakers in Washington know that's how it's going to end, but they pump all these weapons into the Ukraine uh, to essentially degrade to uh, Russia's military uh, to create a kind of another Chechnya or the old uh, Afghanistan, where the Soviet occupation forces uh, fought the jihadists who became the Taliban, who we funded under Carter. Uh, and so he's going back to that old playbook. And he, and he does happen to be right. Uh, but that these current uh, uh, neoconservative, liberal interventionists, all kind of fused into one, uh, see this as a wonderful opportunity uh, to, uh, to if certainly cripple uh, Russia, both in terms of sanctions and in terms of its military capabilities. Any country that is getting close to the United States, especially economically, the United States sees them as a threat. So Russia, so China, they are considered a threat. They'll find any other reason to blame. I mean, the United States government isn't going to come out and say, hey, Russia's economy is starting to boom. China's economy is starting to boom. They're getting closer to us, so we got to go crush them. They're not going to say that. <laughs> they have to come up with other reasons. And this is a, a reality. The United States government wants to be the wealthiest country in the world. It doesn't want any country to pass it economically. It doesn't want any country to over-police more than the United States does. The United States government wants to police the entire world. And that's what they've been doing for a long time. And now that you have countries like China and Russia, where they're like, look, we have our own companies, our own corporations. We can actually get by without you. We don't really need you. We need China more than China needs us. That's where we're at right now. So that is scary to the United States government. Let's go back in. The sanctions are clearly imposed, by the way, to get rid of Putin. Um, but Kitchener's right. If it backfires, the consequences, and I think it will backfire, the consequences are uh, really dangerous for the stability of Europe. I mean, cutting off Russian, you can't talk about war if you don't talk about markets, which I also write about in this column. Uh, they want to stop uh, Russian uh, uh, shipment, oil shipments to uh, Europe. Europe, because then Europe's got to buy from the U.S. at much higher prices. Uh, the the all of Silicon Valley, uh, U.S. manufacturers, although of course most uh, everything is produced in China, there are uh, there are heavy restraints in terms of their access to the Chinese market. So there's a great hostility towards the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and they uh, they certainly are stupid enough to think the threat of war might be a mechanism uh, to open up. Those markets. It's very clear that the, that the, in the in the in their vision, the idea is to take down Russia, uh, and then they're going to take down China, yes. uh, and that's it's of course insanity uh, and dangerous. I mean, incredibly uh, dangerous. But and and we just got a whole public relations display by Biden, where he's essentially he's invited uh, uh, Japan and South Korea to the NATO meeting in. Uh, Madrid, he's trying to create a kind of NATO pact uh, in the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's, it's just, it's nuts, but it feeds the coffers of the war industry or, you know, once again, making more money than they know what to do with. And of the paid political class and the paid pundits who serve their interests uh, are, are parroting uh, what it is they want the public to hear, but it's ex exactly, exactly. Um, Eric, can you... Okay, Eric, remember that um, Julian clip that you sent me last time? Can you put that in um, the private chat? Because the one about war, because I want to play that again for people. And guys, if you just entered, please be sure to hit the like button. That really helps me with the algorithm, you guys. All right, here we go. Exceedingly dangerous. Look, I mean, these people, Biden, the Clintons, 
all of them. They have no business running the country. I mean, they, uh, they've they destroyed the country. Uh, Ralph Nader calls them traitors. He's not wrong. Uh, they're, they're traitors. Yep. Uh, but they perpetuate themselves, uh, and they do it, and they know the growing unpopularity. They do it by essentially shutting out third parties. As you know, I worked with Ralph. Uh, Let's talk about that for a second. I'm glad he brought this up. Let's talk about them shutting out third parties. Thanks so much for that, um, Eric. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, yes, you know, Cynthia McKinney was on here recently. She's been on here before. She's run Green Party. Uh, Ralph Nader, we also know about. There's been Jill Stein was on here also recently. Uh, so a lot of people that we know of have run third party. And you do have people like Hillary Clinton who smeared Jill Stein and started those smears about her saying she was a Russian asset. This is what they do. They don't want anybody else to come in and gain any type of political power, any type of stability for the American people that's actually going to fight for the people and do something for them. They don't want those people in. They want people that are part of the two party system. And this is especially why people who run third party or run as independents, they don't receive much media coverage. One second. Sorry guys, I'm a little stuffy tonight. They don't receive as much mainstream media coverage. Hell, they don't even get much coverage on independent media to be honest with you. And when they do get talked about a lot of times it's through smears. So let's go back in. Uh, uh, and and uh, making sure that you have to be so uh, uh, highly funded uh, that, uh, uh, that essentially you select, they select the candidate as Biden was selected. Remember, I mean, they, yes. uh, everybody, Biden was a disaster. And so they went to their uh, savior who was Michael Bloomberg. And then that didn't work out really. Did you notice how he just said Biden was selected? This is something I was talking about before. Like they pick who they want. Just like the Democratic Party chose Chantel Brown over Nina Turner, the Progressive Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus had already given the signal that this is the candidate that we're going to go with and we're not going to go with that one. Same thing that you see right now with Henry Quaylar and you see with Jessica Cisneros. The same thing is happening. They've already signaled the bell to say this is the guy that we want and this is the person that we don't want. And nine times out of ten, the person that has the most money and the person that is pre-selected is the one who wins. That's how this works, ladies and gentlemen. Now, some people will point back and they say, what about members of the squad that were able to get in? You notice they're having a tougher time getting in now. The Democratic Party adjusted their plans, adjusted what they were used to doing. And they said, we have to come up with another strategy so that these other progressives like the AOCs and the Rashida Tlaib so that that doesn't happen again. That's why now you'll notice people who are running this time around are going to have a more difficult time than that first group that came in. Because honestly, did they expect them to win? No, they didn't. I sat here, and for those who are new and don't know, Anna Presley, I was in her district. She was my city councilor. That's how I was able to vote for her. I watched the debate between her and the incumbent. And I got to tell you, he didn't even try. He didn't even, he didn't fight. He didn't try. It was like he just automatically just assumed that because he had been in office for so long that he had it in the bag. Same thing with AOC's opponent, with Crowley. He thought the same thing. I don't really have to come out there and try. Then when he saw that she was starting to lead in the polls and he was like, oh crap, I got to show up to this community that I'm supposed to be a part of, but I don't really live here and I don't really deal with the people. I actually got to try to win this time. Same thing with Elliot Engel and Jamal Bowman and the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed Elliot Engel. The Congressional Black Caucus endorsed Elliot Engel, the white candidate over Jamal Bowman, who's the black candidate. And this is why I say to people again, everything I just told you, why on earth would you want to go into this party? Why? They're so corrupt. Look at what they do. Well, and then Obama had to intervene and tell everybody they had to drop out. Uh, it's just, uh, and well, meanwhile, we're paying very serious 
consequences for this. Well, it's not. And by the way, so we, you know, you, you like to make it out that it's, you know, uh, Biden and the usual war hawks and the, but it's guess who else it is. So here's Matt Duss. And wh what does he say? He says, good for Kissinger to pop his head up to remind people why Putin thought he could get away with it. Oh, my God. And do you know who Matt? So that's Matt Duss trying to discredit Kissinger, Kissinger calling for peace and, and for uh, diplomacy and negotiations. And I want to oh, and OK, I want to jump in this part right here where he says that, you know, Kissinger is calling for peace and negotiations. This is something that was interesting to me, too, because some of the same people that said, no, no, you, you we want we want peace. I'm like, OK, well, you got a Ukraine flag in your Twitter bio there. Yeah, you know, but I'm not I'm, I'm not against one or the other. I just want peace. I'm like, OK. Now that you have someone like Henry Kissinger calling for peace, now some of those same people are saying, well, no, Ukraine has to continue to fight. They can't give up. They must win. I'm like, dude, they're not going to win. I want to make everyone understand they're not going to win. So essentially, the United States government has given Ukraine billions and billions of dollars to lose. when that money could have went right here to the American people. All that money, what a waste. Let's go back in. Laying out what is going to, this is how this is going to end. And we all know this is how it's going to end. And there's Matt Duss cheering on the war machine. That, and who, why is that important? Who's Matt Duss, Jimmy? Matt Dust was the porn, foreign policy advisor to Bernie Sanders. Uh oh. And now we know why Bernie Sanders uh, sucks so much. Because he filled his campaign with people like that. Who, I'm pretty sure Matt Dust came right out of the Center for American Progress. Uh, I'm pretty. Which, by the way, does no real progress. <laughs> it's one of those organizations that has like a cool name that makes it sound like they're doing something really great, but they're just as corporate and corrupt as the rest. Pretty sure, as did his campaign manager, Bernie Sanders. And now you know why Bernie Sanders went along, goes going along with this. Bernie Sanders isn't saying a peep. He's not doing anything. He's not standing up against this. $40 billion could end homelessness two times over in America. Bernie Sanders voted for it. And so Bernie also doesn't get to brag about voting against the war in Iraq now because you voted to send all this money to Ukraine to fight, by the way. Bernie Sanders is not as revolutionary as he used to be. Now, I'm talking about old school Bernie Sanders. I'm talking go back to the 70s, go back to the like the 60s, 70s, 80s, that Bernie Sanders. He is not as revolutionary as he used to be. In America, Bernie Sanders voted for it. And now you know why we live in a failed state. Because the people who are supposed to be our the champions of regular people, he's supposed to be an independent. Bernie Sanders, which is the biggest bullshit I ever heard in my life, is going along with it. There is no left in America. I keep telling people that. There isn't. Uh, let me chime in here for a second. There may be individual people who are leftists, but do we have a true left in this country? No, we don't. Especially when you compare us to other countries. We just don't. America is a conservative country. I keep telling people this. I keep telling people who have always lived in like these blue, you know, uh, enclaves, people who have always lived in like these progressive, like grassroots areas, like the rest of the country is very much conservative. We're not as, as big as we think, like on the left. And most people, even on the left, are not as far left as I am. So this, this is kind of like, like embarrassing in a way. And since when you think about someone like Bernie Sanders, who again, like I said, he brags about voting against the war in Iraq. Well, him and, it was him and Barbara Lee. He brags about that. But dude, like what you did 20 something years ago it's like, it doesn't matter now because look at what you're doing now. 
It's like the civil rights like leaders or the civil rights activists that like the brag about, I was there with Dr. King. I sat right next to Jesse. I marched in the streets with Malcolm. But now they're like neoliberals who tell you to vote for Joe Biden, who tell you to vote for crime bill Joe. So everything that you did back then, and a good example of this is Reverend Al Sharpton. He likes to say this a lot. I marched with Dr. King. That's great. Dude, what are you doing today though? What are you doing right now? You march with Dr. King for civil rights for African Americans in this country, and you want people to vote for crime bill Joe. Somebody tell me how that makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense. How could you sell out? How could you go down that path? What if Dr. King was alive today? What do you think he would say about some of the people who marched with him, about Jesse Jackson, about Al Sharpton, how they just sold out and got their bag? So I don't want to hear about what you did 20, 30 years ago if you're selling out today. People say stuff like, well, the squad is the best chance we have, Jimmy. You shouldn't criticize them so hard. They're, we don't have the squad. We yeah. don't have Bernie Sanders. The Democratic Party, which means the corporate donors, the corporate class, the oligarchs, they have the squad. They have Bernie Sanders. We don't have anything. This idea that they're on our side is a fucking joke of all jokes. And there yep. it is right there. There's Bernie Sanders, foreign policy guy. When, you know, when Kissinger is to the left of you, I think maybe I would take a look at my position again. <sighs> That's, uh, by the way, uh, Kissinger, you call yourself a war criminal? It sounds like a pussy. That's what Matt Dust is saying. That's what he's saying. And here's Max Blumenthal. Good for Dust to pop his head up to remind people why Bernie has become more hawkish on Ukraine than Henry Kissinger. This is so embarrassing. Like, if I was Bernie Sanders, I would be embarrassed. Like, you should be embarrassed. And the point that Jimmy brought up about Bernie being an independent, I want to talk about that for just a second, too. Because what's the point of being an independent if you know that every time you are always going to caucus with the Democratic Party, you're going to do what Democrat Party leadership tells you to do. At this point, are you still an independent? Because it seems like to me, you're more so a Democrat. Why isn't Bernie Sanders using his independent title to actually hold some type of leverage towards the Democratic Party? Let me give you an example. I'm Bernie Sanders. I'm an independent. Joe Manchin, you want me to sign your bill? Okay. You're going to have to bring Medicare for all to the floor for a vote and you're going to have to sign it. I won't sign any of your bills until you agree to give everyone in this country universal health care. Why doesn't he do something like that? I'm not doing any, you know who does do that? Joe Manchin. He does it all the time. I'm not doing this until you do this. Well, Bernie Sanders, you're the independent. Why aren't you doing that? Okay. And Michael Tracy says, what's the alternative to Kissinger's suggestion, if not perpetual war? Because I still remember when everyone claimed they were sick of that. There's the, the only... Alternative to what Kissinger is saying is forever war. Uh, here's Matt Duss. Folks, if your anti-imperialism leads you to not along with Henry Kissinger, it might be a good step back, a good to step back and take a moment. And I say, if, if, Harry, if you're to the right of Henry Kissinger, it might be a good time to step back and take a moment, Matt. Uh, and here's what Glenn Greenwald says. Your boss, Bernie Sanders, just voted with Marco Rubio, Lindsey Graham, Ted Cruz, Mitch McConnell, Tom <laughs> Cotton, and Liz Cheney to support this $40 billion war package. So I don't really think these sorts of guilt by association tactics are helpful to you right now. Please compare the tweet above from Bernie Sanders foreign policy advisor, Matt Dutt, the one I, Dutt I just showed you, bitterly scolding un- named anti-war leftists for citing Kissinger on Ukraine with the exact same person below twice approving 
citing Kissinger on Iran. So what he's t pointing out is <laughs> Matt Dust just tried to discredit Henry Kissinger. And here's his tweets praising Henry Kissinger when he agreed with him. some good quotes from Kissinger. Schultz. So he's busted here, basically. It's on a Rand deal, but notable that in a long article, they offer no alternative ideas. Some criticisms aside, uh, good Kissinger and Schultz op-ed on a Rand deal. So that's <laughs> who these people are. And let me just bring in Aaron Mate. He says, when Bernie Sanders got Russiagated in February 2020, Max Blumenthal asked Matt Dust why the campaign had not pushed back and demanded evidence for the alleged Russian interference in its favor. Dust said the campaign accepted U.S. intel claims having been briefed convincingly. Oh. And that's because they never intended for Bernie Sanders to actually win. I'm sorry. I had to say the quiet part out loud, but they never intended for him to win. That was never going to happen. I believed in it, too. I thought it could happen, too. But now that I know what I know, that was never going to happen. I think I need to fast forward here, actually. I think we get back to Chris Hedges right about here. Yep. You thought you were getting and then there's the real politic and that's it. Chris Chuck Hedges, uh, what do you make of someone like Matt Dust, Bernie Sanders, the entire left going, uh, being as hawkish as 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 anybody, as Ronald Reagan, as I don't can't even think of anybody. Well, it's a faux left. I mean, it's not a real left. It's uh, it's a left that won't confront American militarism because their political career would end. Even Bernie wouldn't confront militarism. Uh, the, the fact is, if we don't radically reduce military spending uh, and uh, uh, retreat uh, from our, what, 800 military bases around the world, uh, if we continue to essentially uh, throw ourselves into unsustainable debt to carry out acts of feudal and uh, military adventurism, one debacle after another, starting with Vietnam, going all the way through. Um, and, and these people are not, they're never held accountable, both in the the, the kind of uh, pundit class of the Tom Friedman's and George Packers and uh, and the others they're they're all and it's both parties by the way it's Republicans and it's Democrats they're both pro-war the same the Kagans are all the same uh, cheerleaders for uh, all of these uh, disastrous uh, military interventions uh, they never go away they're never held accountable the people who oversee it both politically and militarily are never uh, held accountable uh and uh and you can't confront them if you do confront them it's political oblivion and sanders is smart enough to know that so he didn't do it he won't do it hold on to that thought right there he said that you can't confront them because they know if they do that then it's political oblivion i think he said oblivion right anyway things will go bad for you politically um he's right that's why Bernie Sanders only pushes, but so far. Don't be surprised if Bernie Sanders has gotten approval to do some of the things that he's done in reference to pushing back on certain politicians. Don't be surprised. Just like the squad got, uh, you know, uh, permission from Nancy Pelosi to protest at the steps of the Capitol, they got permission for that. Don't be surprised if the same thing has happened with Bernie Sanders. Well, yes, Bernie Sanders, you can run for president in 2016, but as long as you don't start a third party, Yes, Bernie Sanders, you can run for president again in 2020, as long as you don't extend your movement and continue it after you lose. Yes, Bernie Sanders, you can run for president in 2020. Yes, you can criticize Joe Biden, but don't go too hard on him. Don't be surprised. What if he did, though? What do you think? Of, what if he did? What if he tried to rally the progressives in the House and get people out in the street, all of his followers, right? All of his millions and millions of followers. What if he tried to rally people against this? Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, well, that would show political courage, which he doesn't have. Oh, uh, he, he would end up like Nader. I, that's not conjecture because I was at an event. OK, let's talk about that point. Like he said, political courage. And he said that's something that Bernie Sanders doesn't really have. And he mentions Ralph Nader. And I want to remind you guys, it was what, a couple of years ago? Maybe it was like two years ago. I have to look it up. 
But I remember Bernie Sanders saying he didn't want to go the way of Ralph Nader. Let's hear that one more time. That was pretty cool. Here we go. Accountable. Uh, and uh, and you can't confront them. If you do confront them, it's political oblivion. And Sanders is smart enough to know that, so he didn't do it. He won't do it. What if he did, though? <laughs> uh, what do you think? Well, of, what if he did? What if he tried to rally the progressives in the House and get people out in the street, all of his followers, right, all of his millions and millions of followers? What if he tried to rally people against this? Wouldn't that be something? which is what he said he was going to do when he was running. He said that even if he lost, he'd be outside with his movement. Yeah, well, that would show political courage, which he doesn't have. Oh. Uh, he, he would end up like Nader. I, that's not conjecture because I was at an event with Bernie before at the climate march with Shama Sawan, the socialist city councilwoman, and she kept pressing him to run as an independent. This was before in uh, the first presidential run, 2016. And finally, Bernie said, I don't want to end up like Nader. Well, that was the answer. He didn't want to end up like Nader. His career was, his political career was more important to him than doing what you just said. Dude, he's like, what, 80 years old? Like, how long do you want to still be a politician? Look, let me tell you something. I still want to interview Ralph Nader. I haven't been able to find contact for him. I'll still keep trying for that. But I'm willing to bet, I bet you Ralph Nader is probably living his best life, okay? Ralph Nader is probably like, man, I can go sit on, on my, my porch in my backyard, go sit on my deck, have a margarita, a daiquiri, whatever. I don't even know if Ralph Nader drinks or whatever. I'm just saying. Ralph Nader is probably living his best life. He's probably like, man, it feels so good not to have to fight people in D.C. anymore, not to have to get permission, not to get scolded not to be a part of such a corrupt system anymore. I don't have anybody telling me what I need to sign, what I need to vote on, what I need to say, who I can talk to, which press outlets I'm allowed to interview with. Ralph Nader is probably living his best life. Oh, Sula Moon said he still does his podcast. So there you go. He's probably just like, screw the game. I'm having fun. Uh, and they're ruthless. I mean, I mentioned Henry Wallace. I mentioned McGovern. Uh, they do, the, and the elites conspired against both of those figures. Remember that when McGovern got the nomination, uh, the Democratic hierarchy immediately bonded with the Republican hierarchy to destroy uh, McGovern. And then they changed all the rules. So there would never be a grassroots movement that would be able to nominate uh, a Democratic candidate again. And they like to change the rules. Just like they said during the Democratic primaries in 2020, what if we changed the rules and made it so that the person that had the most delegates was not the nominee? Remember that? They changed the rules so that Michael Bloomberg could enter the race. He showed up last minute like, what? I didn't agree with that. Don't like Bloomberg, but even if I did like him, I still wouldn't agree with that. No, you can't show up like Johnny come lately because you have a bunch of money and now you're just gonna try to take over and win this thing. You weren't there from the beginning, but they let him in. That's what they'll do, change the rules so that the people that they want in actually get in. Again, why do people wanna go into this party? Uh, so he, he knows his history, he knows what would happen, he doesn't wanna pay the price. Uh, it is amazing so demonizing Ralph Nader the way they did, they even got lefties to do it. They and I never felt for I never fell for that shit. So I'm very proud of myself. I never turned on Ralph Nader and pretended like he was the reason that we got uh, George Bush as our president. By the way, those same people who hated Ralph Nader for giving us George Bush now love George Bush. Right there, yep. <laughs> so they and they still hate Ralph Nader. Isn't yeah, that? You know, it was so frustrating. This is factually untrue because uh, they stopped the counting after two counties and they swung it to the Supreme Court and they overturned any legal precedent that I know of and uh, appointed uh, Bush president by judicial fiat. It had nothing. You heard that, guys, about stop stopping the count? I remember that. I remember. 
Sebastian, I'm sorry, but it's the Gen Z in me. Who is Ralph Nader? <gasps> what am I going to do, Sebastian? Let me show you. Wait a minute. Okay, let me finish this. I'll show you a picture of Ralph Nader, and then I want to play that Julian Assange uh, video about the war. Julian Nader? Uh, Gore ran such a shitty campaign, he couldn't <laughs> even carry his home state of Tennessee. So, uh, but but they were frightened of Nader. That's uh, right. Just like they were frightened of Ron Paul. Ron Paul pulled 19%. That terrified him. That was the last time a third party candidate was ever going to get in the debates. Yes. Yes. Ron Paul and also. Ross Perot got 20%, I believe. Ross Perot got 20%. Ron Paul got like 17%. And although this uh, person did not run, Jesse Ventura was actually polling at 18%, but he decided, you know, not to run for president via Green Party. So yeah, that that's actually scary for the duopoly. If you're getting that much, because you have to get at least 5% to get federal funding. So that was the thing too with Jill Stein. Once Jill Stein got to 5%, and I think at one point she had 7%, once she got to 5%, that was when they started to smear her more because they said, uh-oh, now she gets the funding. Now she's actually can pull votes away from us. And that's the idea a lot of times, right? The idea a lot of times when someone runs third party or independent is not so much because they think they're going to win. Now, some do. But sometimes it's a strategy. It's a technique to pull votes away from one of the other parties. That's what happened with Ross Perot. He pulled votes away from George Bush Sr., which George Bush Sr., that should have been an easy second term. But I don't think he I think he underestimated Bill Clinton and well, and Ross Perot, actually. I think he underestimated both of them. So there's there's that. All right, let me go back in. Uh, and, and even in the Democratic primaries, if you remember, most of those, when Kucinich was running, I like Dennis, he's a friend of mine, when when uh, he was challenging the healthcare industry, well, the healthcare into the debates are sponsored by corporations. That's right. Most of them by the healthcare, healthcare, you know, the pharmaceutical and insurance industry. And so they had this rule that you had to be number four, I think, in the top four could only enter the debate. And it, I think when yep. Dennis got to New Hampshire, or one of these states, I can't remember, New Hampshire was first, so it probably wasn't New Hampshire. But anyway, one of the states, he was four, and they locked him physically out of the hall. They wouldn't even let him in. The whole game is fixed. Uh, and if you play by the rules that they imposed, and the squad does, Bernie does, then they'll let you spout off. And uh, I mean, the right wing does it too. I mean, it's a good point you made. Marjorie Taylor Greene's no different. It's all, it's all political theater. Nobody told you. You've heard this multiple times this week. Cynthia McKinney came on and said the same thing. The whole game is fixed. Even if that means they have to change the rules, they will change the rules. I am looking at the time, so I do need to come out of this per se, and I do need to go ahead and play. Let me play this video from Julian where he talks about what the goal of war actually is. Listen to this. This is the actual goal. Because the goal is not to completely subjugate Afghanistan. The goal is to use Afghanistan to wash money out of the tax bases of the United States, out of the tax bases of European countries, through Afghanistan, and back into the hands of a transnational security elite. That is the goal, i.e. the goal is to have an endless war, not a successful war. The goal is to have an endless war, not a successful one. So this whole conflict with Ukraine and Russia can go on for who knows how long. And the United States government will just continue to give them money. <laughs> 